Here is a short video on the story behind the phrase, Trail of Tears. Before we begin, let's quickly address the Native American name controversy, which is still a dispute between various people. As of 1995, and according to the United States Census Bureau, 50% of people who identified as indigenous preferred the term American Indian, and 37% preferred Native American. So for the purposes of this video, and in consideration of those who are indigenous to the Americas, these two terms will be used. The Trail of Tears is the name given to the forced relocation and movement of Native Americans as a result of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. The relocation from the southeast of the United States to Indian Territory, which is eastern Oklahoma, primarily involved the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole Nations, who collectively were referred to as the Five Civilized Tribes. The phrase Trail of Tears was coined from the removal of the Choctaw Nation in 1831. The American Indians had been living in the southeast of the United States for at least 12,000 years. 11,500 years before Europeans first appeared in the 16th century CE. By the 19th century, they had formed five major communities listed previously. The Choctaw people were the first to be removed from their homes, and the methods used by the United States government would be the model for future removals. The Choctaw people were removed in 1831, followed by the removal of the Seminole in 1832, the Creek in 1834, the Chickasaw in 1837, and finally the Cherokee in 1838. Despite the removals, some Native Americans remained in their homelands in defiance of the United States government. European, and later American, expansion into the southeast of the United States had caused trouble for the American Indians long before their expulsion. For many years prior to 1831, the Europeans and Americans had, had encroached further and further into the Native Americans' lands. As territories in the South were gaining statehood, the newly formed state governments did their share in stealing the lands of the American Indians through betrayal and federal military force. The Choctaw Nation who lived in what are now the states of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, was the first community of Native Americans to be expelled from their homeland by the United States government. A series of treaties between the United States government and the leaders of the Choctaw people began in 1801, which saw a continuous reduction in land for the Native Americans. The Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek, ratified in early 1831, ceded the last portion of the Choctaw people's land. This effectively ended the Choctaw Nation in their ancestral homelands. A prominent chief of the Choctaw people during the Indian removals, George W. Harkins, denounced the removal of his people and penned, Farewell Letter to the American People. It was widely published in American newspapers and is considered today as one of the most important documents in Native American history. A portion of the letter reads, It is worth considerable diffidence that I attempt to address the American people, knowing and feeling sensibly my incompetency, and believing that your highly and well-improved minds would not be well entertained by the address of a Choctaw. But, having determined to emigrate west of the Mississippi River this fall, I have thought proper in bidding you farewell to make a few remarks expressive of my views and the feelings that actuate me on the subject of our removal. We as Choctaws rather choose to suffer and be free than live under the degrading influence of laws which our voice could not be heard in their formation. George Gaines, a longtime trader with the Choctaw people and leader in Mississippi Territory, was selected to manage the removal. Beginning in November, members of the Choctaw Nation began the long march to Indian Territory. From Jackson, Mississippi, 
the Choctaw people split into two groups, one which took steamboats and the other wagons, and later on foot. A harsh winter assaulted the groups, exposing them to flash floods, snow, and sleet. Due to the weather, the move took longer than anticipated, leading to shortages of supplies and, most importantly, food. Rations were limited to a handful of boiled corn, one turnip, and two cups of hot water per day. In an effort to hasten the trip, the U.S. government sent 40 wagons to an Arkansas post, which then transported a number of Choctaw citizens to Little Rock. The, the Choctaw chief, thought to be Thomas Harkins, or Nitikechi, called the removal a trail of tears and death. While in Memphis, Tennessee, in 1831, the French philosopher and historian Alexis de Tocqueville witnessed the Choctaw removal. On the removal, he wrote, In the whole scene there is an air of ruin and destruction, something which betrayed a final and irrevocable adieu. One couldn't watch without feeling one's heart wrung. The Indians were tranquil, but somber and taciturn. There was one who could speak English, and of whom I asked why the Choctaws were leaving their country. To be free, he answered. Could never get any other reason out of him. Approximately 5,000 to 6,000 Choctaws remained in their homelands. Those who remained would face intimidation, harassment, and legal conflicts in the newly formed state of Mississippi. As quoted from an unknown source on the difficulties the Choctaws faced, they have had our habitations torn down and burned, our fences destroyed, cattle turned into our fields, and we ourselves have been scourged, manacled, fettered, and otherwise personally abused, until by such treatment some of our best men have died. The Choctaws in Mississippi would later be formed as the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians. Nearly 17,000 Choctaws were forced out of their homes and into Indian Territory. Between 2,500 and 6,000 died along the way. They would later become the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. The Seminole Nation, who had been living in Florida long before Europeans arrived, found their lands being occupied by settlers, at first by the Spanish and later, in 1821, Americans. In 1832, a treaty between the Seminole people and the U.S. government called for them to move west into Indian Territory, on the condition that the seven chiefs of the Seminole people found the new lands in Oklahoma acceptable. After exploring the region they would move to and finding it acceptable, and after conferring with the Creek leaders who already moved there, the Seminole chiefs signed a document indicating their approval of the move. However, by the time they returned to Florida, the chiefs announced that they had not signed the document or that they had been forced to sign against their will, and they also stated they did not have the authority to make a decision on behalf of all their people. Some of the Seminole communities decided to move west, while others remained in Florida, in resistance to the U.S. government and its military. Fighting between the United States government and the Seminole people would last for a decade, beginning on December 28, 1835. On this day, a U.S. Army company of troops were ambushed by Seminole Indians and blacks. The attack would be known as the Dade Massacre, wherein only three out of 110 troops survived. Among those who found the Dade Party in February 1836 was Major Ethan Allen Hitchcock, who would later serve in the Union Army of the Civil War as a Major General. In his journal he wrote of the discovery, The government is in the wrong, and this is the chief cause of the persevering opposition of the Indians who have nobly defended their country against our attempt to enforce a fraudulent treaty. The natives used every means to avoid a war, but were forced into it by the tyranny of our government. 
the Americans were quick to realize that certain members of the Seminole people would resist further encroachment into their lands. In response to the U.S. settlers in Florida, the Seminoles formed raiding parties which attacked farms and settlements. Many of the American civil civilian population fled to forts, large towns, or left the territory altogether. One example was a war party led by Osceola, which ambushed and captured a U.S. militia supply train, killing eight and wounding six. Sugar plantations along the Atlantic coast were destroyed as well, with many African American slaves joining the Seminole movement. While these attacks were being conducted, the U.S. government and militias attacked the Seminoles as well. The St. Augustine militia asked the Federal War Department for 500 muskets and then raised a battalion-sized military unit of 500 soldiers under Brigadier General Richard K. Call. Some members of the Creek Nation also joined forces with the Americans. On the 21st of November, 1836, the United States forces engaged a sizable force of Seminole at the Battle of Wahoo Swamp. Here the Seminole proved their ability to hold their ground in the face of their adversaries. However, the U.S. military presence would become too great for the Seminole people to resist, and casualties on both sides were considerable. This war would be known as the Second Seminole War. The majority of the Seminole people were forcibly marched to Oklahoma, a trek greater than 1,300 miles. Those that remained numbered less than 1,000. Upon the conclusion of the War of 1812, some Creek leaders ceded more of their homeland in Georgia to the United States. The Treaty of Fort Jackson, signed in 1814, signaled the end for the Creek Nation and the beginning of the end for Native Americans in the South. Then Major General Andrew Jackson ordered Creek Indian leaders to surrender more of their lands, ignoring Article 9 of the Treaty of Ghent signed after the War of 1812. The Creek Confederacy eventually enacted a law against any further land relinquishment, making such a crime a capital offense. Nevertheless, the Treaty of Indian Springs, signed by William McIntosh and other Creek chiefs on February 12, 1825, ceded most Creek lands in Georgia to the United States. McIntosh was murdered 90 days later by Creeks led by Minawa. President John Quincy Adams, with the Creek National Council led by Abdole Yohola, nullified the treaty made by McIntosh in the New Treaty of Washington, 1826. However, the treaty was not observed by the Georgian state government under Governor Troop who ordered the Creek people to be forcibly removed. At first, President Adams attempted to intervene, but Troop called out his state militia, and Adams, fearing a civil war, withdrew. Adams would say in confidence, the Indians are not worth going to war over. Eventually, the Creek people were expelled from Georgia and forced into Indian territory, and many of the Creek in Florida were as well. Still, there were about 20,000 Upper Creeks living in Alabama. The state government moved to abolish tribal governments in place and force all the Creek people to submit to state law. An appeal was made by Yohola to President Andrew Jackson for aid, which went unanswered. The Treaty of Cusetta, signed on the 24th of March, 1832, divided Creek lands into allotments surveyed by the Alabama government. The treaty made it clear that as many Creek citizens would be moved to Indian Territory as quickly as possible. Creeks could either sell their allotments and receive funds to leave Alabama for Oklahoma autonomously, or they could remain and submit to state law. Members of the Creek Nation were soon defrauded out of their lands, with government support by land speculators and squatters. Violence broke out, leading to the Creek War of 1836. General Winfield Scott was dispatched to end the violence, 
by forcibly removing the Creek people into Indian territory. The Chickasaw people received financial compensation for their lands east of the Mississippi, unlike the other nations who exchanged land grants. Through this, the Chickasaw received $3 million from the U.S. government, which was not paid for over 30 years. In 1836, after five years of debating, the Chickasaw leaders reached an agreement with the Choctaw people who had already been forced to move to Indian Territory. The agreement allowed for the Chickasaw to buy the westernmost portion of their lands in Oklahoma for $530,000. The first group of Chickasaw people gathered at Memphis on the 4th of July, 1837, with all of their possessions. Led by John M. Millard, they followed the routes the Choctaw and Creek people made previously. Once in Indian Territory, the Chickasaw attempted to merge with the Choctaw though after decades of mistrust, regained their nationhood. In 1829, near Dalanega, Georgia, gold was discovered and started the first gold rush in U.S. history. The region was also the home to many thousands of Cherokee people, and had been for a long time. Regardless, American prospectors descended upon the lands with no regard for the rights of the American Indians residing there. The problems between the prospectors and the Cherokees reached the point where state intervention was called for. In 1830, the Georgian government began to extend state laws over the Cherokee Nation. The matter went to the U.S. Supreme Court a year later, who ruled that the Cherokee Nation was not sovereign and therefore refused to hear the case. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 1832, however, in Worcester versus Georgia, that Georgia did not have the right to impose laws in Cherokee territory, pointing out that only the federal government and not state governments had authority in Native American affairs. The Indian Removal Act of 1830 authorized President Jackson to negotiate with the Native Americans, in this case the Cherokee Nation. With no desire to assist the Cherokee in any way, Jackson used the problems in Georgia to put pressure on the Cherokee chiefs to sign a removal treaty. A treaty which was passed by the U.S. Congress by a single vote and signed into law by Jackson allowed the states of Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Alabama to an armed force of 7,000 soldiers under General Winfield Scott. The soldiers were to round up all the Cherokees in the South, which they did, and then took their captives and placed them in concentration camps near Cleveland, Tennessee. Many Cherokees died while imprisoned in these camps, most suffering from exposure to the cold, starvation, and disease. The homes and farms they left behind were either burned and destroyed or sold to American citizens in lotteries. After the initial roundup of Cherokee citizens in the camps, they were then marched into Indian Territory under the supervision of U.S. soldiers. With regard to the forced removal of the Cherokees, Private John G. Burnett later wrote, Future generations will read and condemn the act, and I do hope posterity will remember the private soldiers like myself, and like the four Cherokees, who were forced by General Scott to shoot an Indian chief and his children, had to execute the orders of our superiors. We had no choice in the matter. The thousand mile march the Cherokees would make began in Red Clay, Tennessee, the last eastern capital of the Cherokee Nation. Most would make the forced march on foot, with scant clothing and no shoes or moccasins. To aid in keeping warm, the Cherokees were given used blankets from a hospital that had recently seen an epidemic of smallpox. Due to the diseases the Native Americans had contracted, they were not allowed into any towns or villages along the way. The route they took would often steer well clear of American settlers, making the journey longer than necessary. On the 3rd of December, 1838, after crossing Tennessee and Kentucky, 
the starving Cherokee people arrived at Golconda, Illinois. Here they were charged a dollar per person to cross the Ohio River via Barry's Ferry. The normal fee for crossing was 12 cents. Furthermore, the Cherokees were considered second-class people and they had to wait for whites to cross whenever they arrived. The entire entourage took some time to cross the river, and many huddled together under a bluff of rocks in a vain attempt to evade the cold weather. Many Cherokees died as a result. Several members of the tribe were also murdered by locals, who, after killing the Cherokees, filed a lawsuit against the government to pay $35 per head to pay for the burials of those they just murdered. On December 26, 1838, a commissary agent named Martin Davis wrote, There is the coldest weather in Illinois I ever experienced anywhere. The streams were all frozen over something like 8 inches or 12 inches thick. We are compelled to cut through the ice to get water for ourselves and animals. It snows here every two or three days at the farthest. We are now camped in Mississippi Swamp, four miles from the river, and there is no possible chance of crossing the river for the num numerous quantity of ice that comes floating down the river every day. We have only traveled 65 miles on the last month, including the time spent at this place, which has been about three weeks. It is unknown when we shall cross the river. The Cherokees forced to move to Indian Territory initially settled near Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Major Ridge, John Ridge, and Elias Bodino, three of the four primary signers of the Treaty of New Echota, were executed by other Cherokees who considered the entire treaty void, as the Cherokee National Council did not accept the terms, and the treaty document lacked the signature of the Cherokee's principal chief, John Ross. Of the 13,000 relocated Cherokees, 4,000, or nearly one-third, died on the Trail of Tears. As with other American Indian nations, some Cherokee individuals remained in Georgia and other states living off the land. Those Cherokees who lived on privately owned lands rather than community-owned tribal lands, were not subject to removal. I fought through the war between the states and have seen many men shot, but the Cherokee removal was the cruelest work I ever knew. These forced removals have been called death marches as between the Choctaw and Cherokee people alone suffered between 6,000 and 10,000 deaths. While the American overlords, which supervised most of the removals, did not actually murder the American Indians while marching, their lack of concern for the lives of those being forced to march was criminal and villainous. Furthermore, the forced marches were usually scheduled during the hottest and coldest months of the year, ensuring the highest possible death toll a clear sign of ethnic cleansing. Alfred Cave, Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Toledo, in 2003, described the removals as an act of genocide. 